نادي عليا مزهر العجائب Let's begin بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وصلى الله على سيد محمد وعلى اله الطيبين الطاهرين المعصومين المظلومين وانا اتذكر القوم الظالمين السلام عليكم السلام عليكم to everyone who's here um to all of you thank you so much for joining in today's session of the Nahj al Balagha book club um it's great to see all of you all of you back alhamdulillah and we will get started we have so many cool things to discuss today inshallah um but first let me just see and check in and see how everyone is doing so i'm going through the register uh of the names i see in front of me so firstly amina assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam you well are you good yeah i'm good thanks alhamdulillah super uh, abdullah i know your mic is working now but let's hear it again assalamu alaikum wa alaikum assalam and you can hear me loud and clear uh yeah amazing i didn't ask you before if i did then i was not able to hear you where are you calling from where are you um i'm in the uk could you be a little bit more specific it's a big country um uh reading reading nice one that's amazing oh i know reading that you have the zenobia center there yeah um, super well thank you so much for being here alhamdulillah i said assalamu alaikum welcome salam i said are you good are you keeping well and healthy oh uh, yeah just like uh i've been basically doing nothing for the past couple of hours apart from a little bit of history work I said haven't you got like games to play and running around things to do? Uh yeah, I've been doing basically nothing for the last couple of hours apart from a little bit of history revision. What were you revising in history? A bit World War 2, those kind of things. And are you feeling up to date on World War 2? I don't want to spoil the ending and tell you how it ends, but it's a big finish. Uh, I already know how it ends. Oh. Like we're just doing revision cuz we have the year 8 exams coming up. Okay, well, good luck for the exam, inshallah, and, and and good luck for the rest of the war that you're studying. Thank you. Uh, good. Fazil, salamun alaikum. Wa alaikum aslam. How are you keeping, my friend? Are you well? Yes, I'm well. Alhamdulillah. Alhamdulillah. Good. Good to have you. Um, I'll come to the assignment later, but just to make sure that you're keeping healthy and everything's good. Okay. Good. Very good. Uh, inshallah, salamun alaikum. Wa alaikum aslam. How are you doing? Are you well? Yeah. All good? Yeah. Good. Very nice to have you, bro. Uh Shazeb Rizvi, salam alaykum Shazeb. How's it going? Wa alaykum salam. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Are you keeping well? Are you chilling? Are you okay? Yeah, I'm good. That is good. What are you up to these days at school or or holidays? What are you doing? Uh started a holiday like a week and a half ago. Just finish your 11. You're just you're loving it now, aren't you? You're on break. Yeah. Have you got anything to do the whole summer or you're just chilling? Uh, might go out here and there. Mm, might go out here and there. Well, inshallah, good luck. I hope you find some productive way of spending time other than being on PS3 all day, but inshallah it's good. Uh, it's good. Wassi, assalamu alaikum. Wassi, if you're talking, I can't hear you. Hello. Assalamu alaikum, Wassi. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, are you keeping well? Is your family good? Yeah, everything's good. Thank you. Alhamdulillah, very good. Good to have you, bro. And inshallah, send my best to to your father as well. Um, I have a message here that Taha is participating, who's Ali's son, but I can't see him in the chat, so I'll assume he's spot out for a second. So if he comes back in, we'll welcome him back. But otherwise, it's our group. This is our group for today, inshallah. So thanks all of you for joining. Now, today there was a mission. If you remember, that was set. uh last week which was well i know what it was i'm hoping that all of you have done it as well and we'll first go through the mission that we had and i'll speak a little bit about one of the pieces of advice the imam has for all of us from nahj al balagha on knowing about allah and how we can use nature and the world around us to understand him and to build a relationship to allah azza wa jalla um we'll come to that point because i really want you guys to understand that imam ali alayhi salam wants us to be close to the world we are living in and seeing the signs of god all around us not just in education but in our lives so we'll come to that point inshallah uh, azan ali salam alaykum azan salam wa alaykum assalam i'm i'm good are you keeping well alhamdulillah yes alhamdulillah good very good thank you so much for joining uh, okay so then we look at that then we'll go to look at some sayings of of the uh, nahj al balagha we'll dive back into a journey through the sayings of the imam 
And just like before, I will ask you guys of your opinion of where do you think this is going? What is the idea the Imam is trying to teach? How do you think the sentence ends? What is he teaching us and how does it link to us? We'll go through the journey of the sayings, inshallah. And then we'll end with a quick challenge, which I will give for all of you for next week, uh, inshallah. Okay, so that's our book club for today. Uh, Sister Isra, assalamu alaikum. Wa alaikum assalam. Who's that speaking? Uh, Khadija. Khadija, assalam. How are you doing? I'm doing good, thank you. How are you? Alhamdulillah, I'm really well. Thank you so much for signing in. I'll give you a quick recap. Today, we're going through a mission that was set for anyone who came last week. If you weren't here, then that's fine. You can just listen to that part. Or if you know, of course, you can contribute. And then we're going to discuss one of Imam's teachings for nature and the planet. And then we're going to talk about some sayings of the Imam. Okay? Yes, thank you. No problem. Thank you for being here. Okay, so let's begin with the mission. Who can remind us what was the mission that was set of those who were here last week? What was the mission? I know the mission was. Abdullah, why don't you remind us what it was? Also, Fazil, sorry. Why don't you remind us whoever said that? Yeah, it was, yeah, was Fazil. Oh, I didn't see the hands. Go ahead. What was the mission? Um, that we had to, to we had to write down what are the why is the world a blessing of Allah? Exactly. What write down something about this world which shows us it's a blessing from Allah. It might be something that you have seen or something you have heard. Maybe something you saw in a nature documentary, but something which makes you think, wow, this is a blessing from Allah. Thank you, Fazil. Now, if you were able to do that mission, if you had time, if you didn't, no problem. But if you did, please raise your hand in the chat. Or if right now you can think of something which you'd like to share about how this world is a blessing. So please raise your hand just so I can see that you have something to offer on this. So I see one hand raised so far. Or you can use the chat just to say that you have done, that you have done this task. Anyone else? Okay, C2. For those of you who didn't have a chance to do it, I see more. If you didn't have a chance to do it, that's fine. If you can think of anything you'd like to contribute, please go ahead. Okay, so the mission was try and name or find somewhere in this world a blessing, which is a sign that it came from a creator. It came from a Lord who is Allah. We want to try and put different examples together to build an understanding of this world as a sign of God. All right, um, uh, Fazil, why don't you go first? What, what what did you find in this world that is proof that it's a blessing of Allah? I've got lots of uh, I've got lots of things to tell, so my turn may be very long. Well, why don't you start with one, then we'll throw it to others, and then you can come back in with another to add after them, inshallah. So, what is your favorite one of all the ones you found? Um, it is about the volcano. The volcano. Why don't you tell us about that? Even though, even though it's a disastrous thing, mm. there it has got some it's got some benefits as well. When the volcanoes erupt, it makes the soil fertile that's around the volcano, and also helps crops such as grapes to grow around the volcano. Wow, it's got quite a few benefits as well. It's not just that it's a disastrous thing. So when people look at a volcano and see an explosion and they fire everywhere and disaster, disaster, when you look at a volcano, what do you see? I see that is uh, that is good for for plants that uh, grow around the volcano. Wow, this is a great point because it shows that if you look once, you might think, "Who is this Allah who's trying to destroy everything?" But when you contemplate, you realize it's part of a process, right? And there are other things that happen that you might not see. So the plants that spread the vegetation the ground the, did you say the soil becomes different around it as well yeah the soil becomes fertile and then obviously that means that you can plant crops and fruits and vegetables like grapes and things right mm, yes green grapes are some one of my favorite fruits by the way just in case any of you are thinking i want to buy a bus pie a gift what do i get him you can get me green grapes i would have no problem we can share it we i like green you like, okay, like you can keep green. the red ones. I'll have the green ones. Fair? <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. Thank you, Fazil. I'll come back to you for another example, inshallah. But then I saw Abdullah's hand. Abdullah, can you also think of an example that you found about how this world is a blessing, something in, in this world? Um, yeah, if you like think about it, um mainly like everything is is a blessing because if like 
also have like an example like if uh, like someone who makes like uh like leather who works on a farm can like make leather to help other people and then we have builders to help people make houses but we have such advanced technology why can't we make the sun or like the sky or mountains that's why there's this there's, a, there's this force of Allah so I think it's um it's great for the sun because um if uh, the sun wasn't uh, a thing we wouldn't be alive right now because it would either be too cold and we wouldn't have any uh, food and we wouldn't have any animals to eat I like this point because there's so much technology and development of the of, of you know human civilization you might think that we might be able to recreate these things but we can't can we we can't make it the way Allah makes it why, why do you think Allah's creation is so special and different to what we try and make it's because when uh, we're trying to make these things we don't have the capabilities because Allah has uh, he can do anything if he wills it but we have a limitation of ourselves so that's why we can't make these things even even like 3,000 years in the future. Yeah. Very beautiful point because we are limited. It's not because of the world and because of all those things, because of us, we just don't have it in us. So that's a really great point, Abdullah. And it helps us to explain all the points as well, whether it's something that's really small and tiny and detailed or something really massive and amazing and magnanimous. We just don't have the capacity to create the way Allah creates um, for the reasons you mentioned. Very good. Then we have Khadija and Asad. I'm trying to think who to go first because I'm back to Fazil. Any money more? Congratulations, Asad. Sorry, Khadija, my commiserations. Asad, you can go first. What is an example of the world which you see as a blessing of Allah? Well, really, it's not like uh, the world is in the world, but basically, probably the entire universe. Uh, so it's not just documentary. Mm. Uh, that's it. That there's something that scientists are very baffled about. That there are some things that are so, uh, so balanced that even if it was one unit of there will be no life in the entire universe, just let alone the earth. As with stuff like radiation exposure. But uh, basically, the point is that uh, uh, the va those values are so balanced, so exact that uh, even if it was one unit of there will be no life on earth. So that's uh, uh, sort of like a blessing. Definitely, it's a balance, like you said. Like there's so many things yeah. that if they're a bit more of one side, it wouldn't work. If more of another side, it would be unstable. Can you think of an example, just so we can understand of why this world is balanced? Is there anything in the universe where it has to be the way it is? If it was even one degree separate, then it just would collapse. Do you know anything like that? Um, that I'm not exactly sure. I mean, I I watched like a couple like uh, a year ago or something. I don't exactly remember. Because you mentioned something about radiation exposure. What yeah, I think radiation exposure is one of those, yeah. Do you, do you know what that means? Uh, basically, how much radiation you're exposed to, literally. So mm -hmm. if there's too much, then uh, uh, we just die if we're exposed to too much. So I think uh, that's like the amount of stars that are in the universe. If there are way too many, then uh, if there are way too many, then uh, there's more radiation for us to be exposed to. Exactly. And it's also the radiation coming from the sun as well, which is the closest star to us. So it's if the Earth was just one degree closer to the sun or one degree further, it would have massive impacts on the temperature on the Earth and the radiation we'd be getting and the need for the plants to survive. So that, that, like that's an example of just one tiny difference and the whole thing would fall apart. So that's a great point I said. Anything you want to add to that or are you, are you happy that your point's been made? Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm basically sure. Yeah. Super. Well, thank you so much. Um, great point. Khadija. What point would you like to add? Can you think of an example of this world which you find a blessing of Allah? Well, all the trees and the wood around us, we can use the wood um, as a very good um, source of material. Well, as a very good material, we can use it for many different things. And we may be able to recreate it look-wise, but we can't create the actual wood by ourselves. So it must have been made by someone else or something greater than us. So Allah. Definitely. Wood is a great example because wood is so versatile. You can do so much with wood. You can, once you, um, you know, extract it from trees, you can mold it, you can craft it, you can change it. 
but the actual resource is the same. So we're being creative, but the thing we're using to be creative is from Allah. Uh, when you look at trees, Khadija, do you think they are beautiful? I think it depends on the tree type. Because some some are made for the use of, uh, for our use, but some are made um, to show how beautiful they are, I think. Definitely. And even when, even when we might not find something beautiful for ourselves or useful to ourselves, for example, there's a bit of, if there's a piece of wood that we can't use or we don't find it attractive, there is some animal which needs it to survive. There is some plants which only grow on that type of tree. There is some fruits or some, or some leaves which only blossom from that kind of tree. So it all has a purpose. It all has a purpose. And each of these vegetables or fruits or leaves are, have a chance to be themselves and express themselves and create or be creative, just like we can with wood. But the resource they use, the thing they use, the stability that exists is from Allah. And that shows us that when we're just trying to be ourselves and be who we are, Allah has given us the tools to do that, you know, to express ourselves. Um, so the point that you made and the point that I add collectively, was we had some good teamwork there, Khadija. So it's so a good work. And, um, and yeah, it is a really nice point and, and I really like it. Asalaamu Alaikum, by the way, to Taha, uh, who's joining. Uh, welcome to the book club. We're just going through different blessings we can see in the world, which... Um, are signs to us of Allah's blessings. Okay, so so Taha, by the way, could you unmute just so I know that your mic is working? Salamun alaikum. I know you're using uh, Arij's account. Are you able to unmute? If not now, then you're very welcome later, inshallah, to make some points. Okay, Fazil, what is next on your long list of amazing blessings of Allah? Salamun alaikum. Alaikum salam Taha. Is that you speaking? Yeah. You're very welcome to the book club. Thank you for being here, brother. Thank you. Alhamdulillah. Fazil, so what have we got for blessings of God in this world? Okay, I've got a next one. This is my second favorite. Second it's favorite. Let's hear it. It's about the plants. Mm -hmm. They take in the carbon dioxide that we breathe out, and animals, especially animals, also breathe out. Um, and also it it also releases the oxygen for all of the the animals and human and the humans because they need the oxygen to survive. Otherwise, if there were no plants, you just take one breath, all the carbon dioxide comes out, and then you'll be just some little, little floppy thing will just die. <laughs> <in the front breath. laughs> that is a nice example with a so with without, a cool ending. <laughs> so without plants, there would be no life on Earth. That's definitely oh, true. I was thinking of drawing a floppy picture of someone just taking one breath and then just goes all floppy floppy on the Imagine, house. imagine if your very breathing would make you flop over like that, like a withering away plant. Um, we don't want that. So we're great to have oxygen. We're very grateful to have it. Uh, and that's a sign of Allah for you, right? How, how comes? Um, because you can't, you can't make the plant breathe and take out the oxygen and breathe in the carbon dioxide you can't make all the teeny holes that they use to breathe in and out mm. that's true we would never have thought of that if we were making something if we were drawing something so that's a really nice point about the the knowledge of allah that he knows what everything needs and how much of it it needs like the plus I've, I've still got four more remaining <laughs> well we do need to move on but um, let me read something that Asad has said. Asad says also plants lower and control CO2 levels in the Earth's atmosphere, which stop global warming. Good point, Asad. Asad, why don't, you, why don't you let us know what is global warming? Could you unmute and just quickly tell us? Uh, so basically when greenhouse, in greenhouse gases such as CO2 and methane go up in the Earth's atmosphere. Uh, so the main, uh, the main reason is to uh, trap heat into uh, the Earth mm -hmm. and uh, make sure that the Earth stays warm. But if there's too much, then the Earth stays way too warm. So if that gets lowered, then the earth doesn't get that warm. It gets cooler. Exactly, which is a massive problem for, for humanity. Amina, anything you want to add to this point? Um, it's a separate point, but... Yeah, um, go ahead. So that's fine. So we know about global warming being, being a sign of something that is evidence that CO2 levels are, are not at the level which they should be. And like Fazil mentioned, it is in the nature of plants 
and hum and oxygen and breathing that we understand how these different gases work together. So that point's been made very well. Amina, what would you like to add to this? So another blessing would just be the whole human body. I mean, we I think we were discussing last week that um, in one of the Imam of one of Imam Ali's sayings is that um, we sometimes get ill because Allah wants to show how weak we are, and yet mm -hmm. our body is amazing at recovering and it is so well de designed that we can't actually see the whole inside and we learn about um everything that goes on but we can't actually comprehend how intricate it is exactly i'm glad you made that point i'm glad you made that point because we don't always know how the body works and why it works that way but you've mentioned a really good example of why the body being limited is a sign of allah like you said because of sickness is part of that process so, so thank you for making that point amina and I'm glad you remembered that from last week. By the way, we are going to talk about the human body a bit more next week. And so thank you for mentioning it now. And if you have any other points, please think about them in the end of today's session. I'll mention the mission for next week. So thank you. Khadija, is your hand raised from before or have you got a new point you'd like to make? Uh, sorry, it was from, from before. That's okay. No problem at all. Now to the rest of you, inshallah, if you're thinking... Um, there are many points you can make about this world being a blessing. Think to your biology or chemistry or physics or science classes in school. Whereas your teacher or in your school, they might not teach it in this way where it's like, this is a sign of Allah. You yourselves can ponder and think about it in your own time. Maybe you spent a whole lecture in school discussing photosynthesis or um, the different planets or the way that chemicals exist and the different breakdowns of each of them and the precise measurement of each chemical and the elements within them. Those things are all of them in themselves a sign of Allah, but you have to look for it in order to find it. It won't just appear to you. Now, sometimes when you go out, like to the park or to the mountains or on holiday, you might notice something and think, wow, that is amazing. That is quite beautiful. And you might think to yourself, well, if, if that's beautiful, then the one who made it must be even more beautiful because he's the one who created it. And there you'll find yourselves learning about Allah through your own experiences. And that's exactly what Imam Ali al-Islam wants from you. In Nahj al the book we're using to make all of these points, there are so many examples about nature, about this world, about this planet, which are, Mam is saying, these are all proofs for you to follow Allah. And you don't have to look into books for these things. You don't have to look into, um, into a classroom only, or you don't have to look to your teachers. You look into the world and you see it yourself. And the more that you see it around you, the more that you realize for yourself that Allah exists. Okay. Fazla, I know you've got loads of points, but I want to mention one point from Imam Ali Islam and Nahjah Balagha. So if that's okay, I'll mention this point and then we move on to the sayings. Is that okay, Fazil? Yes, that's okay. Thank you so much for understanding. Now, the Imam explains to us in one of his sermons that it is actually the way the world was created, which is a sign of Allah. He mentions in the beginning, Allah decided he wanted to create. Now, he didn't decide the way that me and you decided we have a plan and I'm going to do this, this, and this, and this, and I've got to think about it and do I do this? No, no, Allah's not like that. Allah just says be and it is. And when he knows something, he knows it completely. He knows all of the trees that will exist. He knows all of the processes that will form the, the creation of this earth. He knows it's a precise measurement. He is even aware of our own internal bodies. He knows all these things before he creates. So he decides. He doesn't use any tools like we might use. He doesn't use any equipment. He doesn't use any of those resources. He just creates as he wants. Imam Ali Islam says Allah created first the atmosphere. So around um, he, there was space. And in space he expanded it and he inserted in there wind. And the wind blew and blew in the universe. And then he blew into this, into this universe water. Water was formed from the beginning. And stormy waves were made until there was a massive conflict from water in the universe until the wind conflicted with the water and created typhoons and he ordered it to go forward and shed back until rain started falling and now the wind was controlling the rain and it was making different limits for the wind and the wind was blowing the water furiously and more and more and more until it stopped and when it stopped Imam Ali Islam says in the beginning all this motion which used to exist in the winds starts settling in different positions and we start seeing the universe being formed. And instead, all of the motion and activity and that violence goes down into the water deeper and deeper and deeper until water, which everything comes from, starts bubbling and bubbling and bubbling until it is being churned like curds gets churned when it's spinning round and round and round until foam starts rising from that water. And when that foam rises, Imam Ali says that foam 
then rose and the wind blew the firm around and made from it seven skies. And many of you have heard in Quran Hadith that we have seven heavens. We have seven skies as well. The lower heaven, which is the, the, the universe that we can see, he says, it became, it became stationary. It became stable where you can see it very clearly. And the higher level became like a ceiling of all of the heavens. But they did not have pillars which we can see which held them up. Allah held them up through his winds and through the way that they were created. In the lower, lower heavens, Allah then decided to decorate it with stars. And so he created stars. And the benefit of, the benefit of those stars, the imam says, is to become a light for travelers when they are lost and to shine even when it's dark. He says, in another narration, he says, Allah is there even in the darkness of the lowest depths of the earth and the highest, not the, the highest point in the night. For when you see stars shining, you know there is one who shines. So that became you know, a, a guide for travelers that when they were traveling in the night, they didn't know where they were going, they'd use the stars to navigate. And even now, when we use Google Maps and we use a compass and we use all these things, we are using the stars and the planet and the magnetic forces around us to know where we are. We do this even now. And then Imam says, he then hung lights of meteors in the sky alongside a shining sun and a illuminating moon and a revolving sky, a sky which moves and keeps turning. As all of you know, as the earth turns, it looks like the sky is turning as well. And he made everything rotate and have its own fixed term as well. And the rain, the imam says, is an example and a proof of his being, that he's the one who sends the rain down on you. That's how you get blessings, through rain. Some rain you can see when it comes down onto the ground and the plants start to grow, and some rain you can't see. And that rain is the risk of Allah, where he rains down on different places, his blessing, his virtue, um, his risk. And that's why we sometimes feel better, or we have benefit in our lives, or we uh, get wealth, or we get health. These are all parts of the reign of Allah. Okay, this is a very brief summary from the Imam of how the universe was created. Winds and water and conflict and movement until it all settled in a precise form where everything goes to where Allah had allotted it. And we can observe that and draw lessons from it. Now, question to all of you, in listening to all of this, what do you think we can learn about Allah from the way he created the heavens and the earth and the skies and all those things? What do we learn about Allah by listening to this story? His omnipotence. Great, what's the omnipotence? What does that word mean, by the way, just to anyone who doesn't understand it? Uh, God is all-powerful. Exactly, exactly. So he's um, all-powerful and it means that? He's able to create all these things at will. Thank you, Wasi. Abdullah, did you have a point you wanted to make as well? Um, yeah, he's he's one. Because if there were, like, uh, for example, two gods, one god would say this and one god would say that, and there wouldn't be a balance. But since we have a balance for everything that we learn from these points and other points I mentioned before, uh, now we know that Allah is one and only one. That is a lovely point. And a really important point. Everything makes sense. Everything has a system. And if there was more than one being making the system, it would all fall apart. That is a, that is such a good point, Abdullah. Thank you for making that. Fazil, is your hand raised from before or is it raised for a new point? Just so I, because your hand is raised. It's because I've got some more points remaining. Okay, I, I'm asking about this, about the creation of the world. Uh, we don't have time for any of the other points. Um, but if you have any points about this point I've mentioned about what we can learn about Allah through this process uh, feel free to add inshallah okay that's fine but it's not about this is just about my other points that's, that's okay um, maybe we can come back to that if we have time at the end we will see inshallah I said what did you want to add about this wait 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 I said hold the door last time it was you and Khadija I said you speak first and Khadija second didn't I yeah we gotta be fair we have to be honest. We have to switch it around and give everyone a chance. And I'm glad you can take the sacrifice. Uh, I appreciate that about you. Khadija, go ahead. Go first. Thank you. Um, so my point was that um, Allah, Allah obviously is the most powerful, but that means that he can do anything and nobody can stop him, whether they're um, the powerful, they're the most powerful in their city or their country or their continent. Exactly, exactly. None of those things matter. 
None of those things matter how powerful you are on this earth. You didn't create the world. You didn't create the universe. You didn't create the heavens and the stars. So how can someone be that powerful on this earth? Whether they're Fir'aun, whether they are um, Abraha, whether they are, uh, you know, any of the leaders today. None of them are really that powerful. Allah is powerful. I said, now is your time to add, please. Uh, all right. So, uh, uh, so basically, uh, uh, there are two names of Allah, Allah uh, and Akhir, Allah and Al Akhir. So basically, that means uh, the first and the last. So he's the first one uh, to come into this universe, and he's also going to be the last one in this universe. Mm -hmm. uh, so uh, that's just saying that there's nobody else other than God. There's nobody else uh, associated with God. He has no friends. He has no mother, and father. Uh, no sons, like in Christianity, Jesus considered uh, God's son. So, uh, the first and the last, he's the first one to enter the universe, and the last one who's going to remain in the universe. Absolutely. So, he, he shows he's eternal as well. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. a great point. That's a great point. He's awal and akhir, he's first and he's last. And one of the means of that, by the way, means that he's first in the creation of the universe, he's last in that he's with everything that happens with it. He doesn't just create it and leave. Allah's not like that. He makes the universe, but he's part of all of the processes which come after. Yeah, he's still involved in his creation. Thank you, Asad. Um, anyone with any points they want to add now is the chance to unmute or to add anything? No? Okay. Let's, uh, thank you so much, guys. Those are all some, some really beautiful points. Um, and I think you are understanding how the Imam Ali Islam wants you to think. He wants you to link all these experiences that you can see around you back to Allah to understand who Allah is, because it's a really helpful way to know Him. Those of you who have not made any points, inshallah, you can think about this and you can add to anything as we keep going. Um, Fazl, I know you have loads of examples, but we have to now turn to the sayings of the Imam. So hold on to your examples. And if any point comes up later which is linked to these things, you can add them, inshallah. I'd love to hear them. Um, but let's move on now to our journey into the sayings of the Imam. Okay, so let me share my screen. Here we are. And those of you who remember what we do here uh, in this part of the book club is we go through um, different sayings to understand which the which Imam says in Nahj Balagha to try and understand something about the world or our place in it, inshallah. Um, using the sayings of Nahj Balagha. Okay, let us begin. Question to all of you. What might happen if you aren't careful with what you say to people? So, if normally we are careful in our speech, if some one day you decide, I'm not going to be careful, I'm going to say whatever I want, however I want, to whoever I want, what might happen? Anyone, any ideas of what might happen? You can just unmute and say, say, say whatever you'd like here. So Khadija... Um, I did see your hand, so you can go first, but then after that, inshallah, whoever else wants to speak. What might happen, Khadija? Well, they might think bad of you because you might be saying something rude to them, um, and they, they, you might be putting a bad impression if, you, if it's your first time meeting them. So they will, they'll think bad of you, and they might make a bad impression if it's the first time, because first impressions are so important in knowing someone. So you're right, you lose that if you speak badly. Good. Uh, Abdullah, um, what did you want to add about that? Um, if you're um like saying like if you like don't care about what you're saying to someone, you, um it's a saying that don't speak unless you're um, like speaking something meaningful. Mm -hmm. They might they might like take you uh like not very smart or like not like like careful and like, you might accidentally hurt them or you might just keep uh saying words that mean uh nothing. And have no importance to anyone. Exactly, exactly. There's they're saying that only speak if your words are more beautiful than silence. So you might avoid all the things that you're mentioning if you just remain silent. So only speak if you can be sure that you're not going to do. That. You're not going to get bad impression. You're not going to hurt them. You're not going to do those things. So your words have to be special and important. There. Thank you. I said I've seen something in the chat, uh, but I can't read it while I'm screen sharing. Could you say it? Uh, think before you speak. Think before you speak. Good. So what would happen if you don't think before you speak when you talk to people? Uh, you could just uh, randomly say rude things. The first thing that pops up into your mind when you think of someone, you just say without thinking how they might feel. Mm -hmm. Good. Now, uh, by the way, we shouldn't think bad things about people, but it's all about it's about how we speak, which is where 
we determine how someone feels. So you might be saying the truth, you might be saying something which is honest, but if it's not said in the right way, or is not said with consideration to someone's feelings, we could hurt them. Whereas instead we could use those same things to teach them something, right? Um, isn't there saying that um, the Imam Ali said that um, your tongue is um, sharper than the sharpest knife? That's if a you, great saying. If you like say a uh, thing like wrong or hurt someone or say uh, rude things to them, uh, it's like you're like uh, slicing their heart. Wow, that's a very powerful, powerful example. Yeah, that's a great point. We've got to be careful with it. It's a weapon that we have that we have with us. Thank you, Abdullah. Anyone add anything? Uh, yeah, so there's this uh, really, uh, there's a silly phrase that some people say, uh, sticks and stones can break my bones, but words can never hurt me. Uh, but actually, words can hurt you way, way more than physically. Uh, it can hurt you physically and mentally, both. It's very true. Words can words can hurt so much. They can hurt like like swords which strike someone. Um, you're right. I said you're right. I said we have that saying helps us in our own mentality that I'm not gonna let someone's words hurt me. I'm gonna be I'm gonna protect myself. But you're right. They have the ability to cause much more damage than hurting someone. If you're angry with someone, you might feel like I'm angry. I want to hurt them somehow. The the worst way you can hurt them is in in the way you speak and what you say more than physical hurt them physically hurting them of course we don't want to hurt anyone but that's an example of how the capacity of being hurt is so high from someone's tongue any other points anyone wants to add before we look at what the imam says about this point okay so the imam's hadith about this point is obviously similar to all of what all of you are saying which is the tongue is a beast if it is let loose it devours so just like the example which was given by Abdullah about it being a sword here it's seen as a beast and if you let a beast go it can destroy it will devour everything in front of it but of course if you tame a beast if you teach it if you train it then it can help you it can be control you and it can um, cause benefit and value but the moment you let it go and you don't control it it takes over and when something is said you can't always take it back so the imam is saying that control this tongue of yours because it has the ability to become like a beast yeah Think of this example of the imam where every time you're about to speak to someone, if I let my tongue go, it will be a beast and it will devour something in front of me. I don't want to let that happen. So for as long as I can keep control, I will keep control. Anyone want to add something to anyone uh, look at the imam's words and find any other reflections from it? Okay, next one. What is better, a good deed or the person who does the good deed? What do we think? So you have a good deed that all of us can do, like praying or fasting or helping someone. And then we have the one who does that good deed. Which one do we think is better? The one, the person who does the good deed. Okay, go Fazil and then Khadija and then Abdullah. So Fazil, you think it's the person. How comes? Because if you're like thinking of doing a good deed, it will not be as rewarding as when you actually do the good deed in front of someone. I hear you. It doesn't you. always have to be in front of someone. But it's not about the action for you. It's about the person. Yes. Good. Khadija, do you agree? Yes. And that's because it's it's like it's, if you reversed it and said, what is worse, a bad deed or the person who does the bad deed? The person who does the bad deed is obviously worse than the bad deed because they're the one who thought of the bad deed and everything. So... Again, it's the exact same thing here because they thought of the good deed and they did it. They carried out with it. Great way of understanding it. I'm very proud of you that you thought like that. If you flip many times, a good way to do to understand the point is what Khadija just did. Look at the opposite and see what you think about it and if, and if it makes sense. It's such a useful technique to understand an idea. And exactly here, if you mirror this for a bad deed and a bad person, the bad person is so bad because they're the one doing it. Um, interesting, that's good to see where you stand, Khadija. Um, Abdullah, I did see you unmute, and I think it was Amna. I'm not sure, Abdullah. What, what do you think about this? Um, I think uh, it's like really conflicting because, um, if you think of doing a good deed, it, it actually counts as a good deed, but if you like do the good deed, it'll count as more sawab, but you still had the same intention of doing it if you thought about it like a good deed. 
a very, very good point. So you get a reward for thinking of doing a good deed, even if you can't do it. But if you want to do it, you get the reward as if you've done it. But if you think of doing a bad deed and you don't do it, you don't get a sin that you would have got for doing that bad deed. They are different. And that's right, Abdullah. There is a conflict there. Um, but don't you, if you uh, think of doing something bad, but don't do it, you get sawab instead uh, of gana. That's if you think about it and you decide not to do it. You're right. I'm saying if you think about it and you can't do it, but you still want to. So if you think that I want to hurt that person, but you don't get to because that person's left, you don't get a, a sin. But like you said, there's a way of flipping that to make it an advantage. If you have a bad thought, any of you, and you think it's a bad idea, you know that you shouldn't do it. By not doing it, you've done a really good deed. In fact, you get more rewards for not doing a bad thing than doing a good thing because it's about you and your struggle. And Allah knows the struggle that goes through every single action. And that's why you don't get rewarded because you did a good deed. You get rewarded for the effort you put into the good deed. You don't, for example, get uh, punished because you did a bad thing. You get punished because of what your, your thinking was when you did the bad deed. Who have you sinned against? Why did you do it? What made you think that I'm going to do a bad deed? It's in, it's in everything that comes before the action where Allah is looking at and thinking about you and seeing you. So that's a really good point. Um, anyone want to add anything about which one is better, the good deeds or the good person who does the good deeds? I think we have developed a consensus amongst the group of which one we think the imam's going to go with. And you're right. The doer of good is better than the good itself. And just like that, and the doer of evil is worse than the evil itself from Nahjul Balagha. So the imam has even added what you added, Khadija. The one who does the deed is much better because it's about us the action exists in our amal in our actions it doesn't exist anywhere else there's no such thing as a lie but there is a liar you see there is a person who says a lie so so these are all really good points about how we are the people who become the actions we do and we are going to be judged by our actions not just by whether we wanted to do them what we actually did as well great point guys i'm really proud of you for the way you're you're working together on this next saying of the imam what do we think here when is there no point doing mustahab good deeds? Controversial question. I know. Hear me out. Mustahab is when something is recommended that we should be doing. There are many actions which are recommended. But sometimes there's just no point doing a mustahab, a recommended good deed. Why? When do we think that is? Um, I think because if it's um, like recommended and it's not wajib, it's not like that. It is no point, but if you like do it, you could, uh, you always know that if you do it, you would kind of like you'd get like a lot of sawab, but not as much as a wajib thing. So like if you um doing like um mustahab prayers or like extra prayers, then uh it's gonna be um uh, more sawab like added on top of your um wajib uh sawab that you did for um normal namaz and. I don't think there kind of is no point because um, if you're doing something that's recommended already, that's uh, good in itself. Mm -hmm. Well, doing something recommended is does have a point because it's Allah likes it. Allah wants you to do it and it makes you better. It helps you grow. But there are some times it's not about the it's not it's not about the actual deed. There are some times or there are some situations where there's no point doing those good deeds. Now, you've mentioned an example of doing wajib. So one could argue that if you have to choose between doing a wajib act or a mustahab act, which one should we choose? Put your hand up if you think we should choose the wajib act. I said things wajib act. Wasi, Abdullah, Khadija. Wasi. Oh, I saw I said. Okay. And who thinks that if you have to choose between a wajib and a mustahab, we should choose the mustahab act? Fazl, is that your hand raised? Yes. So if he's choosing between wajib and mustahab, which one do you think we should be doing? We should be doing the wajib act, but, but, you, uh, but you can also do the mustahab act as well. It's not that you just leave out the thing that is mandatory and then mm -hmm. you do the thing that, that, uh, that you don't have. Perfect. So that's, that's, that's the point. And also, I want to say something about when there is no point in doing mustahab good deed. When do you think there's no point in doing a mustahab good deed? When you can't even do that mustahab good deed. 
Oh, when you can't do it, you mean? Yeah, sometimes you can't. That's true. You just can't do it. So, so it's like, so it's like if there, if you're traveling somewhere, there's no water, no, there's any um, sand. Because sometimes what you do is like, if there's no water somewhere, you may just take some some sand into your kubu. But if there's no sand, there's no water. Then there's no point of even doing the the mustahakuti. Well, in those situations, you can't do it. So even if there was a point, you wouldn't be able to get it. Um, but I, I get the point you're making So all of you have indicated Something which the imam puts into perfect words He puts it like this Super good So uh, super good story means mustahab worship Cannot bring about nearness of Allah If it hampers the obligatory So what he's basically saying And all of you have suggested this is If you're doing mustahab Which means you then can't do the wajib Then that will not bring you nearer to Allah so it's when you have to choose between, you can only do one or two in a certain situation. So for example, if it's time to pray and you can either give charity to someone, mustahab charity, or you can smile at someone and play with your friends. It's all amongst mustahab, by the way, being kind to people and helping them. But prayer's running out. There's no point doing those mustahab if you're not doing your wajib. Similarly, if we're discussing loads of really cool prayers we can do, salat the layl in the nights and the extra mustahab prayers, they're amazing. But if we're doing those things but not then doing our wajib and once and because we're doing all our energy in those things we just don't feel like doing the wajib namaz salat that we've got to do it won't make us nearer to god we have to focus on what is obligatory because allah has made it wajib for a reason right he's made it wajib for a reason um also if uh if it's like uh layla and you do um the mustahab um prayers and all of uh the recommended uh mustahab uh deeds and um you can't do your um maghrib or isha namaz then it's if he it says um the prophet says if uh if one doesn't do his prayers which is wajib he loses all of his good deeds exactly thank you for that hadith exactly if you can't if you didn't pray your wajib which is the priority, then what was the point of all those other things? Um, great point, Abdullah. Uh, you have a good understanding of hadith, which is very helpful. Please, may I add? Of course, Khatija. Um, so it's like your work at school. If there's an extension piece that you um, can do, then doing all of the ext extension pieces every week, it, it won't help you get your grade up because you're not doing the work that's set for you to do originally and so again it's just like this example if you're not doing the prayers and everything else that's that you have to do no matter what then um you know it there's no point in doing the other things the extra things exactly exactly if you've got homework you've got to do you've got to do it all the other work that you might want to do in addition to it is not going to get you the grade of the work that's actually been set. All that work becomes helpful after you've done the work that's been set because it helps you in the next time you've got to do work. Great point, Khadija. Um, I think you guys understand this point. So it's a great teamwork there. So if you're choosing between wajib and mustahib, prioritize your wajib and then you get to do all of the cool mustahib which will bring you near to Allah because it's done in the right way. Great point, guys. Okay. When, how can having money be bad for you? Open question. Yeah. When you're not using when you're not using your money in the right way. Why might someone not use their money in the right way? Because like in Islam, you're forbidden to drink alcohol. It's like if you pay money for buying alcohol, that that money, that money is gonna be bad for you. By buying the alcohol because it's something najis, something haram that I mean not najis, but something haram that you're having. Right. So they have that desire for something haram and they're using that money to get that to fill that desire. So it's yes. bad for you. Yes. Good. That um, is definitely I, a I have negative. A... And also have... okay, you can talk first now. Uh, no, it's okay, you can finish your point. Okay, so also when you get money from a place which is which is bad, that money can also be bad for you. True, very true. If the source is bad, if it's not halal risk, it is bad for you. Good, Fazil. Um, so like 
I, I was uh, about to say, um, it can, like, if you have, like, lots of money, like, excess money in Islam, you have to pay uh, khums and jihad. And, like, uh, it says in Surah Al-Waqia, uh, um, uh, like, before they were, like, indulging in affluence and they used to uh, commit in the great violation, like, meaning that they use their money and their opportunities, like we learned last time, opportunity is like a cloud, so you should use your opportunities well before they fly away, so it would, like, make you, like, uh, like hot-headed, and, like, make you, like, really full of self, greedy and selfish, if you have, like, too much money, and also, if you have, um, get money, which, like, if, like, uh, what Fazl said, um, if you get it from not a good source, like, um, like, online money, like, meaning uh, money which is not set to a standard, like, um, bitcoin and other cryptocurrencies like that it's actually haram for you and also if you're a middleman in uh in some company and you're not um having any work but still getting paid that money uh is uh not good for you at all definitely there are some jobs which are haram so you've mentioned some which some ulama say can be forbidden uh obviously the 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 scholars have different approaches and you know, we learn from them. Some jobs you just can't do because they're haram. So having that money is no good. Even if you want to do amazing things with it, because you got it in an incorrect way, at the point that you get it, it is bad for you. Now, if you can give it back or change your ways, everyone has a chance back with Allah. But at the point that you receive that money, yeah, it's a problem. It's a problem. Thank you, Fazil and, and Abdullah. You guys worked together to make a really good point. So that's great. Anyone else want to add anything? Uh, so I have one point. Mm -hmm. Go ahead, Asad. Uh, illegally obtained money, like bank uh, robbed money. If you rob a bank and you take that money, uh, you won't get. Uh, it's it becomes haram. It's a it's haram money, uh, and you won't get any survival for donating it for a charity, for example. Yeah, because it's haram. That's true. I said you said very quickly the example of robbing a bank. Just to check, you're not thinking of robbing a bank, are you? Uh, no, sir. <laughs> and you will never rob a bank. Agreed. Uh. Never. No, never. I'm never going to consider it. Yeah. And, if but, yeah. and if we're playing Monopoly and you end up in jail, that's the only chance you're ever going to go to jail. Understood? Yes, yeah. yeah, that is the only time I'm ever going to go to jail. Okay, because you had me worried there. Good. Um, okay. Khadija, I'm going to make, let you make a point. Before you do, Azan's mentioned a really good point in the chat, which is that having this money, it can make you greedy and selfish because you might not want to even share it with your parents. Exactly. If you have certain rights to people like your family, which you do have rights to with your wealth and with your time, if you don't use your wealth for that reason, it's going to make go in backward step and give you negative qualities like greediness and selfishness. Thank you, Azan. It's good to look at qualities that can come from money. So well done. Khadija, what do you think? Um, it makes you very arrogant, regardless of whether you donate your money or not, because um, like if you find if um a poor person finds a five pound note on the street they will be um much more aware of the value of that five pounds um than any rich person and the rich people will think that the least amount that they should be paid or um will paid would be very high amounts or maybe just a hundred at the least which is quite ridiculous see um seeing as they sometimes don't pay their um workers mm -hmm. um so it, it can make you lose your sense of um sorry i don't really know the word but i think the word is like sense definitely you become arrogant and you lose your humility like you don't become humble anymore yeah 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 great point Deja. I'm seeing some really good positive comments in the chat as well of you guys working together. So that's, that's great to see. Anybody want to make any final points about this before we look at what the Imam has said about uh, why, why money can be bad for you? you? You guys are on really good lines, by the way, on quality. Staha, anything that you wanted to add? Uh, yeah, it can make you feel like you're better than other people. But in reality, you aren't actually better than anyone else. Mm -hmm. True, true. You said burden, right? Pardon? Was the word you said that, that you can be a burden on other people? No, better. 
Oh, better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like with money, it's not going to make you better. You can only be better by how you act. Exactly. People might think that you get value from money, right? So in mm. how much money you make or people give you, but you're right. It's not. That's not where you get your value. Where do you think you get your value from as a person? How you act. You're good to other people. Exactly. It's your actions. It's your actions to people. Great point, Taha. And that helps as a reminder for all of us as well to not look at money as that, um, as that value for us. Great point. Uh, okay thank you so much for the points what does the imam say imam says to us that wealth is the fountainhead of passions so all of you are mentioning different desires and negative qualities that you can have like arrogance like being better than people like being selfish like not giving to others these all come from the passions that we have and the imam says that wealth is the fountainhead of those passions just like in a, when you have a fountain the water gushes from there and and you and you see the water flowing from that as the source Wealth is like the source of these feelings which are negative. Now, that's not saying that having money is always bad. It's saying it can be bad if you don't control this water which flows out from there, these passions which flow from there. Just like the tongue, it, has, it can be for you or against you. And wealth can be massively against you unless you control it. And all of you mentioned good examples of how to control it. Giving it in charity, some of you mentioned, giving it to your parents, sharing it, using it for good deeds, not letting it affect your value of yourself. These are all honest and true ways um, of not letting it affect you. Great points, guys. Which leads us to the last question. If you see someone poor asking for money, but you only have a few pennies, should you give it? What do we think? Um, I think uh, yes, because... Um, um, we have another hadith saying if you donate like uh, even like one one like penny or like a really small amount it's it's a really really high swab so even even like if you see like um, someone who's needy and asking for money mm -hmm. who uh, and you have some money on you you should give it to them but there is also one thing that you should try to avoid because there are some people who beg for money, but they use it for not a good cause because some people, they use it for um, buying alcohol or buying other illegal drugs and stuff like that, stuff that which they shouldn't be doing, which uh, like costs a lot of money. So you should like avoid to try and uh, not give it to them because they're using it for a very bad cause. Yeah, unfortunately, there are lots of people who are homeless right now. And because they're on the streets and they're living out in the cold, it's a really hard life for them. And that means that they turn to different places to try and you know, survive on the streets. And sadly, we see them sometimes um, drinking alcohol or using drugs and things like this. However, even though they're doing these things sometimes, not always, that doesn't mean, like you said, we don't give to them. We still give to them because we are there for them and, and we have love for them. It just means that we try not to, we, we can, for example, give them money and help them buy something or give them a gift or not just give them money, but also give money and advice, for example, or money and offer them to help that. Can I call a doctor for you if you like? So it doesn't mean we don't give them. It means that we also care for them otherwise, because these people are also suffering, right? Maybe they're doing bad things, but there's a reason why it's because they're poor. And, and we care for them. Um, I'm sorry. I meant to say a point, but I realized I was on mute. Oh, go ahead. Um, there's a, a thing also. It says, um, I don't remember which mom uh, said this, but instead of giving a man how to fish, teach him how to fish. Yeah, I don't know if that's a hadith. I've seen a saying where teach a man to fish. Um, give a man a fish and you, you feed him for a day. Teach a man to fish, you feed him for a lifetime. So that's the same thing for people who are poor like people who are homeless or migrants or don't have much money, we can give them more than just money. We can give them further help, like advice on how to get a job. We can even give them a job if it will help them get money, give them a house to help them live somewhere so they're not homeless anymore. So we should be thinking much more than that. But if you just have a few pennies, we should give it. I said, Amina, um, you guys are unmuted. What do you think? Um, I think you should provide uh, for your own needs, but at the same time, if it is the case where you could live without those few coins it's way better to give it to someone else who could value it a lot more definitely it means more to them and those pennies you're, you're thinking are small they might not be small to them um good point good point i said you were unmuted maybe your hand was up from before that's fine if not 
Uh, there's a comment here. From... Did you have something you want to say, Asad, or not? Okay, I'm going to guess not. There's a comment here from Azan, which says that every penny counts because if you give even 50p, it can save them from starving for that day. Exactly. 50p, which might seem small to us, can be the difference between having dinner and no food for that person. It can be the difference. So you might think, I've only got a little bit. It's embarrassing to give it. But 50p can mean a lot to them. What do you think, Khadija? I think you should give it, um, but as Abdullah said, you should be careful. And I think you should give it because if if that's all the money you have, um, if you're young and that's all you have at the moment, you're still going to get more money in the future um, because your good deed will be, um, will be shown to Allah and Allah will see it from the heavens and Allah will help you to um will guide you to more money if you give your money yeah let me ask you a question Khatija where do you get your where would you get that kind of money from where do you get it from well I, I earn it like if I do something extremely good for my parents or for my siblings maybe then they might give me um like maybe five pounds or a pound or my birthday. Exactly. So you have you have your family, you, people might have a job and that's where they get money from. But the one who gives the wealth originally is Allah, right? He's the one who gives wealth to everyone. Do you agree, Khadija? Yes. So your, your mother or your family or your parents or the, the job that you're doing, are these the source of the money you're getting or are these a way that you're getting your money from Allah? Think about it. Is the money coming from them or coming from Allah? Um, I think it's coming from Allah because Allah controls in a way what the person who's paying you. Um, mm -hmm. well, I'm not really sure, but he kind of puts it in the person's head who's paying you what to give. And so then it goes to them and it comes to me. Exactly. So even if we're not sure how Allah decides how we get this money, we know that he's the one who gives it and it comes from different people's hands, right? Mother's hand, father's hand, but it, Allah's the one who decides who gets how much. In the same way, that poor person who's getting money, maybe Allah decided that person's going to get their money from your hands and he's using you to give to them in the same way he's using your family to give to you. Because if that's yeah. true, then then we should give because Allah is giving to this person and maybe he's giving me the blessing of being a part of that. Um, definitely. Anyone want to add anything to this point? You have to be careful with what you give because you, you have to make sure that you have enough to live. Not, not, like, not like an absolute king, but decently so that you can't, you're not poor. But when you do have enough, then you should definitely give. Definitely, Daha. Good point. Sometimes the Imams used to give a lot of money, sometimes all of their wealth, um, because they trusted Allah will give them uh, wealth back, back to them that they gave to others. Some people believe this, but this example is if you only have a few pennies, which you're not going to lose them. I mean, you, you're going to be fine. And like it's time Wait, does it, for you. Does it mean it's like you're, you only have a few pennies, not as in you only have a few pennies on you? Literally not. just a few pennies on you. We're not even looking at an example of lots of money, like just a few pennies. Okay, then you, you probably shouldn't. You should get some more money for yourself, then you should start giving to other people. Nice point, exactly. Um, good, good. We can look at what to do when you have lots of money later, but the example is just a couple of pennies. What does the Imam say about these things? The Imam says that you should. Do not feel ashamed for giving little because refusal is smaller than that. So even if you think I've only got a little bit to give, do you know what's less than that? Not giving at all. That's zero. If you give yourself excuses like, I don't know this person. I don't know if they're really begging. Someone told me to not to give to them. They're a human being, just like all of us. And even if they've got things they're struggling with, like they've got addictions which are hurting them, which are like a sickness for them. And that's why they're, they're taking things they shouldn't be taking. Not giving them food is not the solution. Not giving them water is not the solution. Not helping them to get, uh, to make a phone call or to get home somewhere is not the solution and all that money that we give can go towards those things of course we should be careful but also we should be open but the imam says refusing is even smaller than that
So next time you see someone who's homeless or someone who is begging or someone who seems like they're poor and asking for money, think to yourself, I might only have a little bit on me, but you know what's less than this money I have on me? Doing nothing at all. Anyone want to add to this point? Okay, that is the end of the journeys of the sayings. More next week. Well done, all of you. Um, great, great points there. Great suggestions. And that comes to the end of today's book club. Now, there is a mission for everyone for next week. But before the mission, is there anything that was mentioned today which anyone would like to ask any questions about, to be sure about? Any questions or anything to be that they're not sure about? Fine. The mission, should you choose to accept it, is to think about this saying from the Holy Prophet, which is, the one who knows themselves knows their Lord. What do we think this means? If you know yourself, like the human being, if you know yourself, that means you know your Lord. What does this mean? How, in the way we are, our body or our mind or our creation or something about us, can we understand Allah? Now, don't mention anything now, Abdullah, I see on me I know you're bubbling to mention a point. Save it, think about it, and bring bring it forth next week. Okay? The hadith in Arabic is man arafa nafsahu faqat arafa rabbahu. The one who knows themselves knows their Lord. What does that mean? And how can learning about ourselves help us learn about Allah? I will then go through some hadith from the Imam, from Imam Ali alayhi salam in Nahj al the book we are studying, which goes through how the Imam looks at the human, human being to see how it's a sign of Allah. And then we'll go and dive into five more sayings of Nahj al balagha Everyone understand? Put your hand up if you're going to do this mission for next week. Let me see who's going to do this. How does knowing yourself help you know your Lord? Amr is going to do it. Abdullah is doing it. Faz is doing it. Uh, Abdullah is doing it. Khadija is doing it. Who else is going to do this? Raise your hands so I know. Azan is going to do this. Wesley, you're going to do this. Good. Anyone else? I'm looking at those. The rest of you. Asad's going to do it. Good. Inshallah's going to do it. She's it. Perfect. Full house. I look forward to your point, Inshallah, next week on how knowing yourself is a proof for knowing Allah. Okay. That's it. Thank you so much, guys. Take care, Inshallah. Bye bye. Khuda Hafiz. Thank you. Thank you. Khuda Hafiz. Thank you. Khuda Hafiz. Great points today, everyone. Well done. Bye. Khuda Hafiz. Thank you. Thank you so much. Fi amanullah. Well done today. For the office. See you next week, inshallah. Devil ayatika yaliyo, yaliyo, yaliyo.